we hear the term imposter syndrome all the time. Like there's nothing worse than a concrete number to drive your imposter syndrome all the way into your heart. But I'm telling you, like, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I haven't really precepted or charged that much, but you know, that's okay. But like a hard number is really hard to get over. So all of you out there who are looking at your GPA and like gripping the table, I get it. I completely understand how that feels, but you have to find ways to push past that and shine beyond it. I mean, I put myself out there. I knew what my GPA was when I put it in front of these schools. It was like one of these huge risk things because I knew they're going to look at it and see that it's not perfect, but nobody's perfect. And you just have to really fight for that chance to shine beyond that number because I agree with Jenny completely. There are some people that have 4.0s that I wouldn't want to spike a bag of saline for me, honestly. Like, and I mean that, like, that sounds terrible, but like, it's not everything, I guess is my point. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our episode of Serenade School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny, and I'm so excited today. We are kind of embarking on this series, if you heard the one last month, but we are bringing on CSBA students who have, one, or I should say, want to share their success stories with you. Um, I think these stories are, not only are they inspiring, um, but they're so chock full of little gold nuggets. And just something about making a, a, your own CRNA journey relatable is so, so powerful. And so today we have a special guest, Kelly. Welcome, Kelly, to the show. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. And kind of what makes Kelly's journey unique and why I think some of you out there are going to relate to this episode is because Kelly is a second career nurse. Um, she didn't go into her um, career initially thinking she was going to become a nurse, but because of her experience, which she's going to share with you, it led her into the field of nursing and then anesthesia. So I'm so excited to bring that to you today because I've had people who, you know, were dental hygienists, um, accountants, vet techs. I mean, all kinds of people who are like, yeah, I think I want to go back for nursing. And I think they feel a little alienated and like, is this really possible? Can I go not only go back for nursing, but go back for CRNA? And the answer is yes, you can. And so I'm excited to share Kelly's story with you today. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and let our audience know your unique background and kind of how you stumbled upon nursing and then CRNA. Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so nursing was a second career for me, like we talked about, um, initially when I was an undergraduate way back in the day, <laughs> it feels like forever ago, Yes. <laughs> but, um, when I was an undergraduate student, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I just didn't know how I saw students around me who, were in nursing programs or they were pre-med and it all sounded great, but I wanted to find a way to marry the things that I loved about my own passions, you know, taking care of people, addressing communities that are in need, and then really finding that like cup filled from the science of it, the pharmacology, the pathophysiology, the kind of nerdy sciencey things that we all love if we're <laughs> love here that. at this point. So, <laughs> um, so after my undergraduate degree, I ended up working in a nonprofit community public health clinic near my undergrad institution that served patients who were 200% below the federal poverty line primarily. So our patients were um, refugees, they were immigrants, they were people with housing challenges. So a really broad, diverse array of people. And the particular region that I lived in was very heavy with um, all different types of refugees and immigrants. So it was a really diverse population. And we provided medication and referral assistance to those patients who, if they came to our primary care clinic and needed, let's say, a GI referral or a sleep study or needed to get fitted for a CPAP, they would get a referral from me to one of the university institutions nearby. And so I did that for about two and a half years and was reading notes all the time and interacting with patients. And I was like, you know, I kind of want to get a little more in with these patients. I want to see what's going on. I want to put hands on people, see what the deal is over here at these hospitals. So I applied to nursing school and that's kind of the beginning. Awesome. I love that. And I just love your passion too, for helping those in need and people that don't have anything. Um, it really comes across and just how passionate you speak about it. Um, but I would love to know when you decided to go back for nursing, kind of how did you get into, or how did you learn about anesthesia? Sure. So I loved everything about kind of critical care when I first started learning about critical care in um, nursing school. My clinical rotation was on the surgical trauma intensive care unit. 
And I knew day one when I put a pencil Doppler in an empty eye socket that I wanted to be on <laughs> that unit. Um, I know that's kind of gross. That. So <laughs> that graphic awesome. warning, <laughs> graphic warning. But literally the first thing I did as a nursing student was put a pencil Doppler in an empty eye socket for a stitch pulse. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> and so ever since then, I knew that I wanted to kind of pursue a career that was really going to challenge me, maybe make me say ew at first, but then really <laughs> make me kind of want to know more. Working on a surgical ICU as well as a trauma ICU, I saw so many post-operative patients come up that were just disasters or even ones that like looked perfect when they got there, but the case was not perfect. And I looked at those people and I was like, you guys are the ones that kind of managed every part of this. You're the reason they're up here looking okay <laughs> now. And I was like, well, what's that like? And so I started to talk to more people on my unit, got a really good rapport with our CRNAs since they drop off patients to us all the time anyway. And um, just started to discover this is the next step for me. This is an amazing way for me to take this, the things that I love about taking care of people even another step further. I love that. Oh my gosh, you just gave me goosebumps. I love that. And so much about the fact that you knew, you mentioned earlier on that you love the science aspect of, you know, going into healthcare and kind of the nerdy part of it. So that was probably like step number one, right? And then yeah. step number two was that you were like, I'm going to see, I want to get more hands-on because nursing's very hands-on. So you yep. went back for nursing school and then your nerdy, your love for nerdiness, you know, blended. <laughs> and I think a lot of critical care nurses, that's kind of them, right? They love the pathophysiology. They love the pharmacology. And what better unit to really see all that unfold right before your eyes than critical care. I also equally love that you love the surgery aspect of critical care and the sense that managing those patients, whether they're trauma, surge, trauma patients or surgical patients, it comes with a lot of different, you know, cause I was medical ICU. And so while, you know, sepsis was really huge and things like that. Um, surgical patients may have just lost their entire blood volume. Right. And now they're coming to you. And like you said, they may look really great when they first get there, but you know, you know, that there's still a rough road ahead. They could go into, you know, trolley. Right. So right. Um, I love that. And I also equally love that you spoke to CRNAs that you were get, getting report from and really established kind of a connection and relationship um, with them to kind of broaden your your horizon. And, um, yeah, I think all that was just, you know, if you guys are asked this type of question, especially like in an interview or even on your personal statement, um, kind of the story that Kelly gave right now, while I'm not sure, you know, if you did go into this in your personal statement, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, I, I just, I like it cause it's really personable and it's, it's really, you know, whether I have never done any of those things before myself, but it's relatable in the sense, um, that it makes Kelly seem very, human and just true to herself. Right. So that's kind of what I get from this. And I know schools equally would just love this type of background and story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious too, did you actually share any of this on your admission essay? I did. Yes. So I talked a lot about that experience of seeing healthcare from a primary care perspective, and then taking that kind of all the way up through into the surgical trauma ICU, because one of the, for example, one of the things that I dealt with most of the clinic was I need help filling my Kepra. I can't pay for my Kepra anymore and it's getting really expensive. I'm needing to decide between feeding my kids and paying for my meds every month, which I think we've all heard that kind of story being told before. And then all the way up on the ICU, I'll see patients who have been in car wrecks because they had seizures because they ran out of their mm -hmm. Kepra. And there's this, you know, the world isn't just isolated in its pockets. It's all interrelated. And I've gotten to see that happen kind of in real time. So I did talk about that. And I talked about the importance of detail. It's like mm -hmm. this attention to detail in healthcare that we need to keep our eyes on because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to, based on your background, like I said, no one, I think to the average ICU nurse, and I'm even speaking for myself in general, um, being cognizant of those types of situations where patients may actually be a trauma patient, but because of the story you know, again, you're more connected. The reason why this happened is because there's a, there's a problem with our ability to provide care for these populations, you know, who can't afford to take medications, um, right. that they need for their lives. Right. And so then it leads to bad outcomes. Right. Oh, so I love the fact that you have that background. You can bring more awareness into the community because of your passion for it. And I think it's going to do so much good. So 
Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it really, it made me want to work somewhere where I would get a lot of exposure to critical access hospitals and independent care because those patients are some of the most needed in terms of anesthesia, in terms of that type of care. They need that as well. And I want to make sure that they get it. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So I would love for you to share um, some of your application stats. And um, while I want to preference this with, you know, don't play the comparison game if you're listening, but I, I know equally you're wondering, everyone always wants to know this. Um, so go over things like your, your GPA. And if you can break down your GPA, if you can't, that's okay. But just if you know your science overall and last 60 credits or just overall what your GPA was, um, same thing with how much surgical ICU experience you had um, and things like that. Sure. So I'm going to start with the, you know, everyone wants to do the, the GPA right off the bat. Well, don't worry guys. Mine's not that competitive. So mine was a 3.0 flat for a science GPA. My last 60 credit hours was a three, two, eight. So I really was not ever considered competitive, at least from my side and probably many of your sides too. Mm -hmm. Um, that was my Achilles heel applying to CRNA school. That was what held me back for so long was just this fear that that number mm. was just going to drag me all the way down. And there was no way that I was ever going to get in. So, um, my GRE was 313. That was on one try. I, um, have been on the surgical tra trauma intensive care unit for four years. That is my only nursing job that I've ever had is um, four years on STICU. Let's see what else. I um, academically, I have my TCRN trauma certified registered nurse. I have my CCRN. I um, was published this year in Critical Care Nurse as the co-author on a study regarding EHR and time spent using EHRs um, in the intensive care unit. Um, as far as leadership, I am the chair of my unit-based council. I have been for two years. I am the chair of the surgery and trauma service line at my hospital. I oversee six different units, including my ICU and the education community service opportunities that go on in those units. I'm a board member of the AACN chapter locally here in Charlotte. Wow. Let's see. Yeah. I, so I had to make it up. Okay. This wow. Is I mean, so, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, this is what I would tell anyone who's applying to CRNA school. If you have an Achilles heel, you know what it is and you're worried about it. Just broaden your horizons, do a lot of different things because I feel like those things, mm -hmm. all of it made up for the fact that my GPA wasn't that great. I could yeah. speak to so many other examples of how I can put my head down, get work done, that I can be dependable, that I can be reliable. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's one I of the most impressive, <laughs> impressive. I mean, I was like, whoa, she's continuing to keep adding to that. Yep. Um, that's amazing. So, and I love that point. Yeah. GPA wise. And that's why I stress so much. I mean, stats are stats, but you guys, they don't just pick you based on a GPA. They don't just pick you based on your ICU experience. They really want to know who you are as a person and what makes you tick. And you know, clearly Kelly's background, she's passionate about helping in serving populations that are in need, but she's clearly has the passion for serving because by being a chair on your unit-based council and a trauma line for the education and a, on the AACN and being published in a, in a um, cr critical care nurse, I mean, all those things show that Kelly is wanting to give back. And and serve the population at large, and not, not just the the patients, but the but the nurses that she's working with, because that's exactly what she's doing. Um, she's trying to you know foster mentorship and leadership within the, her own nursing community. So that is huge. And they may look at this, you know, and say, "Wow, well, can can she hang it in our program?" I really love who she is. I love her community service. Like she'd be a great asset to our community. The only thing that they would have to question is, can she get through our rigor of our science courses if this is what her science GPA is? And you did state that your GRE was a 313, which is very good. So congratulations. I mean, Thanks. high five to you. Holy cow. Thanks. Well, that was the other thing. I thought the same exact thing. I thought I need to show them that I can handle the rigors of an academic program and in some way. You know, the GRE, a lot of people have different feelings about what that actually means as far as your mm -hmm. aptitude. But I did know that it's a number and I needed to crush the number in order to show them I can take a test, basically. Right. <laughs> and I, I love can't that. study and put my head down. Yeah. Did you take any other graduate courses or anything like that prior to applying? No, I didn't, which was a big risk. Um, but I 
essentially approached this application cycle. I should say that I applied once and got in the first time that I applied to school. But I knew going in that this would probably be like a feedback year. I kept calling it my feedback year. You know, I'm going to apply. They're going to tell me exactly what I'll need to take, assuming they would tell me to retake classes because of my GPA. And then I would just kind of keep rebuilding, you know, keep doing a lot of what I've been doing, but augment it, take a class to buff up my GPA. But that didn't end up happening, which obviously I'm very excited about. But I did go in mentally kind of prepared to get the feedback of you will need to retake some classes because I know it's a weak spot in my application. Right, right. I love that. And I love your your attitude about it, too, because you call it a feedback year. And I, I think that that just shows that you have the right mindset yeah. going into a competitive application um, the fact that you knew that if this doesn't work out, that you would just get feedback and you would try again. So I want to highlight feedback, that. Not well. failure. That's what I kept, I kept telling myself. Feedback, not failure. <laughs> yes. Feedback. I love that. Thank you. That, that's you guys remember that feedback, not failure. I love that. I, I may use that down the road. I'll yeah. shout out to Kelly for that. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah. it's funny. We were talking earlier before this podcast went live and, um, I, what did I, I mentioned, you know, every time you say yes to some something, you equally say no to something else and that you have to fill your own cup before you can pour into someone else. And she's like, are you my therapist? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I would love to be. <laughs> because I equally need my own, like that you have to remind yourself the right mindset can really pull you through so much in this world. So it's so important that you head into everything in life with that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I kind of have another, um, before, before you go ahead, I just wanted to say that I also have another, um, kind of unique aspect of my application process. I did initially apply for a bridge program. Um, the, I know we've talked about not necessarily mentioning programs specifically, but this was a bridge program Mm come that came out of a, um, university up in, Oh, up in Ohio, actually. And they um, have 10 schools that were affiliated with this bridge program to where if you were accepted into the bridge program after the completion of their curriculum, you would automatically matriculate into one of those 10 schools affiliated with this bridge program. Have you heard of these before? I I think you have. For nursing school? Yeah, No, for um, CRNA school. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. And I thank you for not mentioning the Pacific um, program. Um, I, I would think that this would probably be okay, but I guess I don't, without knowing yet, let's just keep it off. But um, I know what you're talking about. And so for those of you who are curious, um, if you want to reach out, feel free to do so. Um, Just hello at CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com. I know exactly what you're talking about, but yeah, I think just because we haven't asked permission, we'll just, we'll just leave it off for now. But yeah, thank you. That's, that's good to know because I didn't know that. And so for those of you, and, and did you do that because of your lower GPA? I did. I thought that I would be a good applicant for that type of program because it was described to candidates who knew that they had a weak spot in their application and maybe wanted to strengthen their academic background, their experience before Mm -hmm. applying and going to CRNA school. So I thought that that was the right choice Mm -hmm. for me. So I applied, I interviewed, and I got into that program, but there was this voice in the back of my head that said, you can do this the traditional way. Like, Mm -hmm. just give it a shot, see what happens. And if not, then, you know, that's the choice you made. You can take that loss and keep it moving. And I'm really, really glad that I did. And that would have been a fantastic option for me. Uh Um, Cost-wise, it maybe would not have been a great option, which is what I ended up saying to myself. It's like, you know, this is a lot of money. Why don't you just try the traditional way first? Right. So, so you did this bridge program and applied to a school, a regular school, just to kind of see how, how it shook out. Yes. So I applied to the bridge program, got into that earlier this year, but then turned it down because I just didn't want to pay the money that, you know, just yet. Right. I, I knew it would oh, be given a, it a chance regular. I wanted to give myself a chance. I kind of owed right. it to myself to try it the old fashioned way. So yeah, yeah, no, I love that. And thank you for sharing. Cause that is unique. And you know, that just shows too, that you had, you had faith in yourself, that you believed mm-hmm. that you had a lot to offer despite your GPA. So I love that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think, you know, that, that bridge program is a great option for, for many students. But like you said, you know, I, I also equally think it's more in line and I've even heard this described from, um, you know, the faculty who run it, um, that it's for students who have been rejected, right. Who, mm-hmm. um, who have not, who have already given it a shot. And so I think they'll equally say, 
that they want to see you give it a shot, right? That, yeah. that they want to see you try the old fashioned way, as you call it. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is a great option for those who meet a lot of resistance otherwise. So <clears throat> thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, sure. Now, I, you mentioned all kinds of leadership roles, but did you, what about your shadowing and um, did you have any job shadowing experiences with CRNAs? Yes, I did. So that was a very cool, meaningful part of my journey because I think that th- this is probably what really made me believe that I, I, I always thought I could be a CRNA, but this experience made me believe I could be a CRNA. Mm. So yeah. I had a patient that was crashing and burning at one o'clock in the morning because, you know, of course they do. That's when they like to go <laughs> crash and burn on you. So yeah. I had to take my patient to the OR um, stat in the middle of the night for a revision of a wound that was bleeding profusely. And this patient was really hemodynamically unstable. So I took the patient downstairs to the OR. I presented the patient in front of the room. I said, this is Mr. So-and-so. This is what's going on. These are his lines, his drips. These are what our vitals have been so far. This is where we've been out on our vent. Um, I've given this type of product and, you know, that was the case. Basically, you know, I left it left in there, dropped the patient off, went back upstairs and tried to speed chart for like an hour. And of course it was a really quick turnaround time. But when the CRNA came back up and dropped this patient off to me, she pulled me aside and she was like, that was one of the best reports I've ever gotten from an ICU nurse. You were really thorough. You really knew what you were talking about. I can tell that, you know, what's going on with this patient. She said, please tell me you're applying to CRNA school. Uh-huh, that's and, I was cool. like, and, I, and I like pulled her aside and I was like, I first of all, thank you for like saying all that, because it means a lot to me that people Mm -hmm. in the field see it, recognize it and reach out as soon as they, and she saw this potential in me essentially. And I barely saw the potential in myself, but she saw it in me. And that made me really feel like, oh shoot, maybe I really can do this. Like maybe I can succeed in this. So she said, do me a favor, shadow me, like come see what's going on. We'll check out, you know, what it's like here to be in the OR. And I was like, sure. So I shadowed her um, a couple of times and our cases were, you know, relatively straightforward from, I think from her side of things, but of course everything's new for me. You know, there's no such thing as straightforward for someone who's never been in that environment before. So she really was just a huge mentor to me, not just by showing me the ropes in the OR, introducing me to people there, but also kind of advocating for my success along the way. I love that. I love that. And I love how you kind of emphasize the fact that you went from wanting to be a CRNA to believing you could be a CRNA yeah. because of this interaction with an actual CRNA. And, right. you know, that's, that's the power of connecting with a current CRNA. And it could be something, it doesn't even have to be something this massive, you guys. I mean, I even know for me, like when I did, actually did job shadow, it was a kind of the same thing where having that experience really lit me up where it kind of made me want it even more. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that just seeing it in action and seeing like, I mean, and the same thing, like, wow, can I really do this? But it was the, the passion and the drive that really was allowed me to push through some of the rejection or some of the potential fears that I was facing. And so I just love to see students get this experience. And for you, it obviously clearly gave you that, you know, you talked about your, um, what did you call it? Uh, not your clutch, but you called it, what'd you call Achilles it? Heel. Yeah, your Achilles, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So it allowed you to kind of like say, you know what, I'm going to quiet that voice down. Right. And I believe, I believe in my ability to do this because, and you guys, GP is not everything. I'm a big, you know, I, I, I highly dislike, I don't like the word, the H word. I don't say the H word, <laughs> but I highly dislike being limited by a number. And mm-hmm. I just feel like it's such, and, and you mentioned the bridge program and I truly believe that's what they believe as well. And right. I have mentors of mine who are CRNAs who did not have the best GPA. They are phenomenal CRNAs. You do not have to be a rocket science and good at textbook type tests to be successful in your career. You really, really don't. Unfortunately, because, you know, programs want to keep their doors open and they ha- you do have to pass tests to, to, to pass, right? So it's like, but it just, you have to believe in yourself. And I, I really think that plays so strongly into whether people take a chance on themselves. And I think just like you said, you were potentially not going to take a chance to yourself because you, you doubted because of that one potential limiting factor. So you did look at ways to make up for it, which I think is really powerful and it speaks a lot to who you are. Um, but yeah, I agree you have to believe you have to believe to move forward. 
Right. So. Right. I mean, my, you know, we hear the term imposter syndrome all the time. Like mm. there's nothing worse than a concrete number to drive your imposter syndrome <laughs> all the way into your heart. But I'm oh. telling you, like, you just have to like, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I haven't, you know, I haven't really precepted or charged that much, but you know, that's okay. But like a hard number is really hard to get over. So all of you out there who are looking at your GPA and like, you know, gripping the table, I get it. I completely understand how that feels, but you have to find ways to push past that and shine beyond it because it's worth putting your, I mean, I put myself out there. I knew what my GPA was when I put it in front of these schools. It was like one of these huge risk things. Cause I knew they're going to look at it and see it, that mm-hmm. it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. but nobody's perfect. And you just have to really fight for that chance to shine beyond that number. Because I agree with Jenny completely. There are some people that have 4.0s that I wouldn't want to spike a bag of saline for me, honestly. (laughs) Like, and I mean that, like, that sounds terrible, but like, there's there's just, it's not everything, I guess is my point. So yes, it sure is not. Um, I love that. And actually, I'm kind of curious now that you brought this up, did they actually ask you about your, any of your undergrad grades during your interview? Yes, they did. Awesome. Okay. So that's, and I've, I've heard this, this is pretty common, you guys. Um, so just be prepared. Uh, it's okay. You know, um, naturally they're going to be curious and I'm curious to what you said about your undergrad GPA. Sure. So they, in the middle of my clinical portion of the interview, literally in the middle of dissecting some pathophysiology, someone at the table was like, so your GPA barely made the cutoff. (laughs) So you can imagine I'm already second guessing myself because this is the clinical part. It's tough. And then right out of left field. They're like, so your GPA is right at the cutoff, huh? And I said, yeah, you know, I didn't know how to study. I didn't know how to learn. And I know how to learn now. I know that small class sizes are better for me. I know that a little bit of one-on-one time after class is the best way for you to learn. They're writing down the things that I don't feel. I gave concrete examples of how I study now and how I've been successful now, because you know, to, to age myself, when I took those classes that drove down my GPA, that was 11, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. I am not the same person that I am mm-hmm. 11 or 12 years ago. So it was my job in that moment. And it's going to be your job. Those of you with low GPA mm-hmm. to show them that you are not that person anymore and that you've learned. And I gave the example of my GRE being, you know, a good score that I took and passed my CCRN and TCRN. So show them that you've grown and show them that you have different ways of tackling the beast because every beast is going to be different. Just like CRNA school is going to be different from undergrad and from nursing school too. Hey, future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration from a CRNA school prep academy student. After three years of applying and a lot of rejections, I finally got an acceptance letter to one of my top choice schools. Coming from a background of being told and treated like I'm not good enough for most of my life, the mental gymnastics I had to do was real. For the past three years, I have purposely been putting myself in a position to be told I'm not good enough. And I was told that many, many times. The difference is, since becoming a nurse, I know that I am good enough. My socioeconomical and educational background was not so great growing up, and nursing was my second career. When I was younger, I lacked confidence in my educational capabilities as a young adult, and it was not until I went back for nursing that I realized I could be smart enough. I wrecked my GPA when I was younger, so I had to work hard to correct it. I did that in nursing school with my BSN, but I had to be extra aware of what programs use the last 60 credits or nursing degree calculations. Despite having six years of ICU experience and 10 years overall, I had to return to the ICU to gain recent experience, which when you have a cushy IR cath lab position was no easy task. But I can say now that it was worth it. I'm going to do this and I cannot wait to get started. I would like to thank Sterney School Prep Academy and all the resources and support that is available. Thank you, Jenny and Richard, and everyone else for making our dreams a possibility. Start date, June of 2023, SRNA signing out. Congratulations, CSBA student. If you're listening, I know who you know who you are. I'm so incredibly proud of you. I know you've been at this for a long time. Um, So those of you listening to this story, if you can relate to the feelings of not being good enough, I hope this story hit home. And let me remind you that you are too capable of achieving your dream of becoming a CRNA. If you're not already signed up for our free future CRNA newsletter, be sure to do so now. Pause this episode and go click the link in the show notes in the comments below. Cheers to your future. I'm rooting for you. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, exactly. You were nail, like hit it on the nail as far as you just have to have, you have to be prepared. And so the worst thing that you could probably do, honestly, if they were to bring that up in an interview, guys, is have nothing to say, <laughs> right? 
is to kind of just be, you know, shock, you know, shocked and just be like, well, I, 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 you know, just that would sound like you hadn't thought through. Um, but you should, it's to be expected if you have a lower GPA or if you have a C or even a, a D in your, in your past, you need to have to explain that and not as an excuse per se, but what have you done to be better? Um, no, I didn't. I had a good network on the unit where I work. Um, I, it's my home unit. I've been there for four years, so it was not challenging for me to get those recommendations, but I know that that is a challenge for those of you who are traveling or who have sought out different experiences in different ICUs. Awesome. Okay. And did you have to do a, a manager? Um, who did you actually end up asking overall? I did. I asked my manager. I asked a, my clinical supervisor on nights and I have two PAs that I talked to who can vouch for my clinical aptitude the best out of anyone up there because we were essentially one-on-one with them. Awesome. Okay. I love that. Do you attend any open houses or any kind of uh, like a C- our CSBA conference or anything like that? I can, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I did a lot of little like webinar type of things. I think that I did one for one school. Um, I definitely used um, the CSPA resource bank. I mean, I felt like all the time as I was applying, I was just kind of looking around and seeing what resources were available for the schools that I was applying to, to just get a better idea of the school mm-hmm. and the the metrics and the expectations from those places. Awesome. Okay. So you, you probably did attend some type of virtual open house. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. Okay. So you did connect with your school. I like to point that out because I think it's, it's just really insightful. Most successful students that I have found most of the time have attended either an open house or have at least connected with their school in some way um, prior to even applying. So what, what did you fear? I know you mentioned your GPA, but other than were you unsure about yourself otherwise, or, or I know you spoke to that you, once you had that shadow experience and you connect with the CRNA that you truly started believing, but did you always feel very sure about this path? That's a really good question because the more I think about it, the more I think that, yeah, I think I was very sure about this path for me. It just felt right. It felt like the right thing for me. As far as approaching the application process, there were a lot of moments of doubt of, is this a group that I would fit in with? Are these people who think in like me in the sense that we can get some good work done together? That'll be with like-minded people who have the same goals in mind when I'm in the OR one day. Mm. That was kind of a fear of mine because I think for me personally, it's really important to be surrounded by people who they're not on the same exact page as me, but we all kind of have a common goal in mind that we want the person on the table to come out of it better than, you know, as, as good as we can, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that means for that patient. Um, And then putting our own egos on the shelf and realizing that this is not about us at the end of the day. This is about the patient. And some of the people that I've interacted with over the years, we've all heard, oh, the money's great. The money is so great. The schedule is awesome. And I'm like, right, but you're, this is a career. This is more than just like a paycheck. Like Mm -hmm. I'm going back to school and spending this money and time in my life to have a fulfilling job. And I want that to be fulfilling. And I think the biggest puzzle piece for me along my journey, the biggest fear was that I would not find as much of a passion in this, in this role, but I've learned just every day that that's, there are so many people that think that way and feel that way out there. And that's really exciting for me. Yeah. I love that you shared that. That's something I feel like I haven't heard often, but I can speak from my eight years of being a CNA that kind of you're head on as far as when you're in the operating room, you, you are a team. It's a team effort. You know, everyone in that room has that goal and you do, it is nice because it's, it's, it's never <clears throat> not, I shouldn't say never, but you know, people are there for that goal, that purpose to get the patient safely off the table. And you do collaborate, you do work together. And it, that part is really fun. And mm-hmm. you also learn a lot from that. That's actually what I like a lot yeah. about the teamwork mm-hmm. is because I learn and I love learning. Learning is fun. <laughs> learning is stimulating. Learning's it just it's growth, not both educational, but just personal too. And sometimes that's not even like technical knowledge. Sometimes it's just finesse. Sometimes it's just a preference. And right. even learning a preference to me is growth because it allows you to see a different perspective. Yes. Um, yes. So a hundred percent that happens that. every day in the OR. And so I awesome. love that you you love that because you will be really fulfilled and um. Yeah, yeah, you are picking a, a career and you're picking one that, because 
I'm talking right now, money and schedule. Yes, those things are nice. And I'm all about schedule. I'm a big, because I mean, we have three little kids. So schedule right now is like everything, but I equally mm-hmm. wouldn't like my job if I didn't find it fulfilling, right? I don't care right. what schedule they gave me or how much they paid me, but if I physically hated doing what I did, then it wouldn't matter. All those other bonuses, perks wouldn't matter. Exactly. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And sure. thank you for being very vulnerable in that um, sure. process. And, um, you know, I hundred percent know with confidence, you're going to find your crew. You're going to find your people. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I will say right now that at least in my own experience, and I've heard this from so many students that when you go to CRNA school, <laughs> The people that are in your class, you will find, and I'm not saying you have to connect with every single person in your class, but you will find your lifelong friends there. You will find your tribe. You will find the people who just get you, who understand you. And it's just, it's just amazing. Again, I have, you know, I will always have these friends and we may not talk every day, but we know that we're each other's, you know, we know that we went through so much together and that's kind of what it is too is you're going through CRNA school together and you're supporting one another. And so that right there builds a long lasting friendship. So awesome. I'm so excited. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, super excited to start. <laughs> yes. I'm so excited for you too. Um, what would you say out of um, all the CSB resources? I know you said you kind of dug into a lot of them. Was there anything or any things in particular that you hit maybe more than once or that you really found really uh, useful in your time preparing? It's hard to pick one, but I definitely know when I was getting ready for my interviews. So I applied to five schools and was extended to interviews. And when I was preparing for those interviews, I did the five day prep. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it off the top of my head, but it's like still open in my, (laughs) it's still open in a tab (laughs) somewhere. But, um, I looked at those videos and took notes on those videos and studied them. And if I had any questions about the content, I dug deeper on my own time in those videos because it was just so comprehensive. And I think one of the biggest challenges when you're preparing for an interview is knowing that there's a ton of stuff out there, but how to find that kind Mm -hmm. of in a really good condensed place that's focused on the goal, which Mm -hmm. is exactly what CSPA did essentially. It's like, these are things you're gonna need to know as an ICU nurse or a critical care nurse that are directly applicable to the world of anesthesia. And it's right here, it's in, in a condensed place So focus on that and then focus on having, you know, your own patient example. And I felt like that was really, it just gave me peace of mind of like, I'm not just holding my hands out in the dark, hoping I bump into the right thing. It's like exactly tailored to the future CRNA. So definitely loved that. That was a huge, huge help for me. And then what else did I use? I used the forum for sure. Um, I think Richard Wilson put up a math review or a pharmacology review that I found really, really helpful. Um, that was a live session. That was really fun to just, I kind of felt like I was in class again. I'm oh, such yeah, a- Oh yeah, yeah. The study like, sessions so, we started. I know you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I was just like, oh, like here I am in the midst of a ton of stress and I'm still like, oh my God, I'm in school. Yay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a dork. But yeah, I use, I mean, really just clicking around and you'll just see this list and just pages of really helpful things. So I, I used a lot of different things. I love that. And I love your reference. I, one of the things that actually even one of the main reasons why we created the, the NAR boot camp, the nurse answer resident boot camp so is because we'd see students get accepted and then they go awesome. like binge watch YouTube or buy all unnecessary books to try to start reading. We'd see students, you know, binge watch YouTube, like Khan Academy or whatever, and like just spend an absorbent amount of time trying to read anesthesia books or things that are just not going to serve them for where they're currently at in their journey. So again, we developed uh, an boot camp and CSBA for that very reason, because we wanted to make sure that you had everything you needed in one, one spot. <laughs> you don't have to worry about trying to read all the things and know all the things that are out there on the internet because yeah. it's, it's not realistic and you're not going to get a good understanding by doing that. You're going to have a surface level knowledge if you try to do that, where if you focus in on the concepts that we teach it's like we build upon that and then you grow your understanding. And from there, it allows you to really display your knowledge in the interview. And then really gives you a head start when you start your programs too. That's secretly what I actually am aiming to do too. I don't necessarily speak to that. because I think everyone's like, Oh, just get me in, just get me in. I'm like, but what Uh, we're actually doing is making you stronger students. We're making you like, and I say this probably more to like the faculty I talk to and stuff, but we're really building future leaders. That's, that's truly what I believe. I believe we're building CRNAs who are pay it forward CRNAs. We're building CRNAs who are going to go into this career path and really have a lot of fulfillment, enjoyment, 
they're going to go to school and have a better understanding. They're going to have an easier transition. They're going to like not be as stressed and mm-hmm. you know all of that. Like it's about the journey. And if you can make that journey a little bit more manageable, that's kind of how CSBA gives the good foundation for that. So I'm excited to hear you, Doug, and everything. And thank you for sharing. I've heard that five-day interview prep shouted out so many times. So I'm so glad yes. it's been so oh. helpful. Um, how did you feel your interview actually went? I, I know you said you had two interviews. Um, did you feel like both of them went well? I, I still have like, you know, my own gripes about it. I'm like, Ooh, no, probably not. But they did because <laughs> I got into both schools that I interviewed at. Oh. So, um, but the, the very different styles. So the mm-hmm. first one was an in-person and it was all day and it was broken up into sessions. It was very, I thought it was really nice to kind of meet everybody else who's in the same boat as you. Mm-hmm. Something that I did intentionally though. So um, if, you know, if you're one of those people that kind of gets a little bit spooked by everyone else around you and you start to compare, I sat in the front of the room. So I wouldn't be staring at the people in front of me all day. I just kind of was like, I'm just going to focus on myself because that's what I'm here for. Mm, love so it. Instead of watching people, you know, sit back with their hands behind their head and their leg up on the table being like, yeah, I got this. No problem. You know, like I'm not one of those people. So I was mm. like, I'm just going to sit in the front, focus on myself and we're going to get through this day. So um, it was broken up into three different um, portions. One was emotional intelligence. One was a clinical portion and one was a kind of grab bag, a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. There were about two to four people per session and they were about 20, 15 or 20 minutes long um, each. And those were spaced off throughout the day. They kind of had you on a schedule. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the second interview that I did was all virtual, all online. There was a sort of meet and greet at the beginning of the day. And then you had your specifically scheduled interview during any time the rest of that day that you were scheduled. And that interview was two parts, about an hour long. One was clinical and then one was a professional and emotional um, intelligence-based session. Awesome. Okay. So you you definitely sound like you had a pretty good blend even in both experiences, but yet different. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that. And so many schools are really heavily focusing on this emotional intelligence aspect um, because they're all tell you, we can teach you, <laughs> like we can right. teach you the knowledge, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's much harder to make a quick change when it comes to emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence can be built and it can be, can change. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh man, I think I stink in that area. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> because I sure as heck did too. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, and it's, it's sometimes it's not like, if you're not what quote unquote emotionally intelligent, doesn't mean you're a, a bad person. Doesn't mean you're a doesn't mean anything negative. It just simply means all it means, you guys, is that you're not in tune with yourself. That's it. That's yeah. what emotional intelligence is. It doesn't mean you're a rude, mean, inconsiderate person. But when you're in tune with yourself, that allows you to be in tune with others. And yeah. so by recognizing how you react to certain things others do, it allows you to quickly and better communicate in a way that is um, effective. That that's really it. Um, so clear that comes with time and age and you don't start off at 16 years old. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine what a 60 year old (laughs) emotional intelligence probably doesn't even exist at that point. Uh, Maybe it does, you know, everyone's different. So it's more about paying attention to yourself first and understanding who you are and how you interact with others that allows you to create meaning and communication within your own environment. Um, yeah, so it can be built upon. It just takes a lot of time. So schools, you know, know that they can teach you knowledge pretty quick, right? (laughs) But emotional intelligence takes you actually to do the work. And so it's not like someone can say, Hey, you need to do this. You'd be like, well, you know, whatever, but what's your problem? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong with me. I'm fine. I'm fine. But it's like, no, you need to recognize maybe, to be a little more humble in the sense that you're right. Maybe I have some room to grow. Maybe I should pay attention to that. Maybe I should recognize that. And maybe it is my fault. Like, I think a lot of emotional intelligence is accepting sometimes that maybe you could have done something better um, and not getting defensive about it. So can you see yeah. how that's a little bit harder to teach? You know, <laughs> sometimes people are coming at you saying you need to improve upon your attitude. And you're like, who are you to say that? You, you know, so it's like, well, then I'm not going to get through to you, you know? Versus taking on someone who's already very open to that type of um, feedback, as you call it, Um, you know, it makes it so much easier in clinical too. So I love the way you put that. It's really about asking yourself, just take a second to ask yourself, why did I react the way that I just did? 
Love it. And like exploring that a little bit more Mm -hmm. and kind of finding out like, why was I so angry when she said, Hey, you need to do this differently. Like, where did that come from? Am I hungry? I mean, that's my answer most of the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it could be simply as like, I'm hangry or it can be like, (laughs) I had a terrible day and I had an argument with someone before I got to work today. And I'm clearly not in the mood for anyone to give me feedback right now. So just like being a little more like conscious of like, Mm -hmm. why? exactly I am (laughs) yeah the why and it's it's not as easy as it sounds I feel like some people are like oh that sounds so basic but kind of the way I challenge myself and the way I've equally challenged some of you know my my own students and with that precept is don't just you know when you get to the why when you understand why you felt that way you have to ask why yet again because then you have to investigate well why did okay so I felt angry because maybe their tone came across that they weren't pleased with me. And that made me, and then why, why does that make me feel icky? Well, because maybe I'm, maybe I'm insecure about that. Why am I insecure about that? Well, maybe sometimes some, something in the past, even if it's in your childhood, maybe you were teased about that, or maybe you were self-conscious about that because it made you feel like you were less of a person. You're unworthy. I mean, I'm talking deep, you guys, it it sounds ridiculous, but when you get deep with your whys and not just one, why, 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 you'll unravel a whole lot about you and understand that you are in full control of the meaning you place on the world around you. And that meaning can really shape your thoughts, feelings, and emotions and really shape your own happiness and how fulfilling your life is. So anyways, not to get too foo-foo on this episode, but I just, I wanted to put it out there that challenge yourself, start doing it. It really (laughs) Definitely. And honestly, for those of you who think this is like kind of wooey and everything, I'm here to tell you, they are going to ask you in an interview, why did you feel that way? Where do you think Mm. that feeling came from? Why do you think you reacted like that? Mm. So if you're not asking yourself these things already, when you are ready at your dream school and you got there and you're ready for that interview and they start to ask you why you reacted the way you did and you can't figure out why, Mm -hmm. now is the time to start thinking about why you react the way that you do or why you feel the way you do in a tough situation. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, when you get the language for this too, Mm -hmm. you will be able to tell them why, and they will be able to see how you handle stress and how you handle it when you're uncomfortable, because you don't want to blank. You don't want to freeze up when they say, Mm -hmm. oh, you got upset. Why? And you're like, I don't know. Cause they were wrong. No, not the right (laughs) answer. Right. Like like you're exploring this for your own well being, not just in your personal life, but on interview day, which a lot of you are here for that in a lot of ways. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was, that was great. And yeah. And it, it just goes to show that that's exactly why they're asking these questions is because they want to see if you started to unravel yourself a little bit. Thank you so much. This episode is, is amazing. So I'm so excited for your, for this to go out to everyone. Um, I would love to kind of end this episode though, to share with the community, um, a couple of things. One, if you could go back in time and do anything different, um, what would that be? I've been thinking about this question um, a lot because part of me wants to say nothing. I wouldn't do Mm -hmm. anything differently, but we would all do something differently. The only thing that I think I would have done differently is as soon as I figured out that I wanted to pursue CRNA, maybe just retaking one class so I could just edge myself up a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like an advanced college level, not retaking chem 101, but like taking an advanced pharmacology or pathophysiology course from an institution that also offered um, a CRNA program that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, I would um, probably have done transcript audits much earlier as well, just to really get some concrete feedback on how to go forward. Um, But honestly, I I feel very lucky that my journey turned out the way that it Mm -hmm. has so far. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that. And I love the fact that, and I truly and I, I love that you mentioned you still had some things that you had done differently, like retaking the advanced, um, retaking a, an advanced pathophysiology of farm or looking at your transcripts a little bit heavier earlier on. But I really believe that you are who you are, Kelly, because of your past and because of your struggles. And that to me is beautiful. I, I actually, not that I want everyone to struggle, trust me, that's not what I'm saying, but I know like my own previous struggles in my own childhood and where I kind of am today made me who I am and it made me aware and it made me passionate and it made me care. And I think if I hadn't had my own personal struggles and same with you, I don't know who I'd be. Like, I don't think I would be the same person. And so it's, it's easy to say, well, I wouldn't change anything because, but like you said, there's always some kind of things that you could have done differently. And 
Um, I love that example that that's a very concrete thing. Um, but ultimately you are who you are and that's something to be proud of and, and just be respectful of that. Don't, don't, um, turn around and say, well, I wish I, I was a better student earlier on. Well, why? Because it made you learn how to work hard. It made you learn how to improvise. It made you learn how to go above and beyond in other ways, um, to compensate. And that taught taught you discipline, grit, perseverance, and you wouldn't have that if you were a straight A student. And I think that actually, and I, I actually come from a family and I love my sister. We're, we're best friends, Mm -hmm. but you know, growing up, she was a straight A student and I was not, I was barely a C D student. I mean, I struggled to get C's. (laughs) So, you know, I remember my parents being like, well, why, you know, they just gave me all a hard time. Like, why can't you do it? You can do better. You can do better. So I started thinking as a kid, like, well, I'm just not enough. I'm just not smart. I'm not ever going to be smart. My sister can, you know, barely study and get A's and I'm just, my brain must be different, you know, Mm -hmm. and it really gave me a complex, but what it did and what it didn't necessarily do for her. And when I, and I see this now as an adult, um, it made me learn other ways to, to work around it. Kind of like what you spoke to. And it did have to overcome the mental blocks and the fear of not being enough and not being smart enough and all those things. But my sister, when she got out of college, she struggled when things didn't go well, right? She didn't know how mm-hmm. to improvise. She didn't know how to get herself out of the gutter. And I, I call it that because I frequently had to get myself out of the gutter. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I had to learn pretty early how to pick myself back up after being kicked down where she hadn't been kicked down until she was an adult and she was in the workplace. Right. And so it was much, it, it was hard to watch her struggle that way. You know, someone I love, but I mean, she's fine now. Don't get me wrong, but I just, it just saw it as two different paths to get there. Right. We've both gotten more emotionally intelligent and figured out how to kind of compensate for whatever our weaknesses are, but they just look different at different ages. And I think students who get straight A's and go to CRNA school, I think that there can possibly be in for a little bit of a rocky, uh, discovery (laughs) where they're going to be kicked, you know, and, and have to deal with that for the first time, possibly even academically. Right. Right. And I'm bringing that up because one of my room, one of my classmates and equally one of my good CRNA friends, um, she was a straight A student and she got her first C ever in her entire life oh, wow. when she was in our advanced pathophysiology course, which actually was before CRNA school even started. And our <laughs> program, I know, right. I'm like, this poor thing. So our program oh, no. allowed one C. If you get any more C's, you're out. So she had her one C before the program even started. Oh my so God. you can only imagine the anxiety. She ended up being on a beta blocker. Um, yeah, she had no a kidding. massive test anxiety. And uh, because of that one experience, and she had never experienced a C, right? So it wrecked her. And it kind of like identity yeah. crisis kind of situation where she was like, who am I? Maybe I'm not actually smart. Maybe I am not going to do this. And so it was, we, as friends, you know, obviously we yeah. did a lot with her and really helped her through that. Um, but I'm glad she had us because she could have given up right then and there. Anyhow, I just, um, I hope that leaves you guys with something to think about. And um, Kelly, one last question. How would you say big picture wise? Um, I know we spoke to some specific examples, but how did CSPA kind of play a role in your success? Do you feel? So <clears throat> CSPA definitely played a huge role in my success. I think it was nice and good for me mentally to see a community of people who didn't have it all together, you know, like, <laughs> not that I love watching everyone not have it be perfect, but to me, the CRNA applicants that got in were just picture perfect, not a toe yeah, out of line. Love that. Like, just, they just had it all going for them and seeing these posts that are like, um, you guys, I have a terrible GPA. Like, what do I do? Or I feel like I bombed this interview. What do I do? I'm like, you guys, oh my, I I literally just want to like reach out and be like, I'm sure you didn't. I'm sure you're (laughs) amazing, but it really, it's helpful to know that like, and maybe this sounds obvious to everybody else, but when you're surrounded by these top tier, high performing people all the time, who just want to crush it and do their best and they're type A and they've Mm -hmm. always knocked it out of the park and you're not that person, you sit there and you think, I can't cut it with these people. I'm Mm -hmm. not good enough. And there are both top tier, high performing, high caliber people and people who, who doubt themselves in the same place. Mm -hmm. And it's all a bunch of those people helping each other see their potential and learn from each other and grow and point out resources. And it's just this roadmap that I otherwise would not have had in my journey. And I couldn't be more grateful for just like some landing pad for every anxiety and doubt and insecurity about this process. If you haven't subscribed and like 
bought in like buy-in because it was really, really worth it for me as far as my journey. And I think it will be helpful for anybody, even if you feel like you've got everything locked in, you know, just explore it a little bit more because you're, it's only going to serve you and make you a stronger applicant and candidate at the end of the day. Oh, well, thank you, Kelly. That's so sweet. And I love the fact that you, you were just, again, so spot on with the fact the community's there, whether you're a high achiever or someone who's always struggled, like we're all in it together. And as I spoke to my, my friend who equally struggled, she was a rock star in clinical. She, uh, she had job offers every single clinical site she went to. And I'm like, well, gosh, I'm not getting those, but yet she struggled academically, right? We all have our own unique strengths and that's to be celebrated And the community. That's what the community does is we celebrate you. We pick you up when you're down. We, we cheer you on when you're, when you're up and, you know, we, we push you forward. And a lot of times that makes a really pivotal difference for those who are otherwise questioning and, and it's so easy to play the comparison game. I know you mentioned, you know, sometimes oh you see gosh. people and you're like, man, I'm never going to be that. And, but, but the reality is that's okay. And that's actually good because you are you. And that is, that's what mm-hmm. we want. We want you, we want Kelly, you know, we, we don't want Kelly to be Sarah, you know, so right. it's okay that you don't look the same. Um, Cause you're going to go and change this world, Kelly. I'm just telling you right now, I'm just so honored to be a part of your journey. Oh. You're so passionate. You've been a huge part of mine. So I really appreciate it, like genuinely. And um, I I just can't thank you enough for having this, for hosting this, for thinking of this. Because when you talk about, you know, earlier you mentioned like, you know, I'm called to serve, like, so are you clearly called to serve because this is you giving back to those people that were like, I'm not an A student, or (laughs) I feel like there's, you see the potential beyond the metrics and the numbers. And that's having a someone in your corner like that means everything to people who know that they can do a good job in this, in this field, but just can't get past the process of applying. Mm -hmm. So I really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. The feelings mutual, Kelly. Thank you so much for coming on today's show. Um, And to the listeners out there, we appreciate you. Thank you so very much for tuning in every week and uh, until next week, take care. Hey, Teacher CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you, so screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong, and I'll see you next week.